so I am Valérie Meunier. I'm an economist working with uh, Compass Lexicon. And um, I you know, uh, want to thank you for uh, staying with us uh, to, to participate to this roundtable, where uh, we will discuss the economics and the policy considerations for vertically integrated platforms. So you know, uh, next steps from what we have heard in the previous uh, session. Uh, we've heard very interesting insights in, into uh, different uh, studies. And uh, for this roundtable, I'm very grateful uh, to have here with me uh, our uh, very distinguished speakers. So Silke Hossenfelder. Silke is the head of the general policy division of the, uh, of the German Bundesgattene, where she has been working for, you know, uh, uh, since, uh, since 1992. And her role currently includes advising the decision divisions representing the Bundeskartelamt within international organizations and being involved in competition law reforms at national and European level. Uh, Alexandre, the Strel, hi Alexandre, is um, whom you will, will know because he's a um, uh, uh, professor and researcher uh, on European law at the University of Namur and also uh, very involved at the Research Center for Information Law and Society. And he's also the academic co-director at the Center on Regulation uh, in Europe, CI. Uh, he um, has many other roles in his portfolio of roles and uh, is working extensively uh, and researching extensively on regulation and competition uh, competition policy in the digital economy, as, as well as on the legal issues raised by the development of artificial intelligence. And Damien Jardin is the founding partner of Jardin Partners, which specializes in competition law. And um, Damien has worked for many, many years in competition law, being a lawyer uh, and a, uh, also a legal scholar in those issues. He's uh, been involved in many uh, big, you know, uh, tech industries, tech sectors, and is very interested in in this current debate on, um, you know, the regulation of uh, digital markets. So, in the, for the first part, <laughs> uh, where we would like to to discuss to the extent to which we can draw a parallel between uh, between vertically integrated platforms on the one hand and other vertically integrated uh, firms, uh, we'll hear from uh, in order from Damien, from Alexandre, and from Selke, who will who have offered to speak each for five minutes, and then they will respond to each other, and then I invite you also to. Uh, to participate, ask questions, and and uh, or make comments to the extent uh, you are inspired by the topic. So, uh, I think Damien, you're. Uh, uh, I'll leave the microphone and the floor to you. Well, thank you so much uh, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you uh, th this afternoon. Um, uh, the topic that you have asked us to speak about is uh, of great interest to me because when I started my academic and legal career in the 1990s, um, I spent a lot of time, that was my focus at the time, looking at vertically integrated industries in um, you know, uh, the network sector. So focusing on telecoms, electricity, transport, postal services. and um the, the question you have raised in this first part of the debate is the extent to which you can draw uh, comparisons between these um you know network industries and uh digital platforms um it is true that in both cases um you have uh, a degree of, of vertical integration uh but there are also significant differences and i would like first to focus on these differences I think I can see five major differences. Um, uh, the first one is that um, very often criticism were made against uh, telecoms operators or electricity operators on the ground that uh, their prices were high and their services were of low quality. I can be be bear witness to that having 
had to deal with the, the Belgian uh, state monopolies for uh, a part of my life. I think when you talk about digital platforms, um, very often the problems are not a matter of high prices and low quality. Uh, many of them offer free services and the services are of high quality. Uh, of course, uh, it depends which dimension of quality you're talking about. If you consider that privacy is a form of quality, then of course you can consider that some of the services are, are of low quality. But let's say generally, you know, um, high prices and low quality are not the main uh, problems. Uh, secondly, um, one criticism that was made of uh, telecoms and, and electricity operators was one of quiet life. Um, they were not very dynamic. They did not invest as much as they should have had. They were not uh, very innovative. Once again, I don't think that these sort of criticism can be made about uh, digital platforms. Um, Many of them are quite dynamic. They, they tend to invest quite a lot in R&D. Um, of course, it depends on the counterfactual. Uh, it is true that these companies come up with new products, but perhaps if the markets were more competitive, you would have more innovation. So we have to be a little bit careful, but compared to- <laughs> Could you please go on mute? That would help everyone. Uh, um, so, but 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 compared to these uh, sort of you know historical incumbent in in network industries, I think there is a fair amount of innovation and and dynamism. But it's not always the case. I mean, um, if you think about you know Internet Explorer of Microsoft, one of the arguments that was made uh, by the European Commission and the complainants against Microsoft is that they had literally abandoned the product. Uh, which was no longer innovative. The only reason why it was still popular was because they had a monopoly. So I think that we have to be uh, a bit cautious when we speak of the innovativeness and the dynamism of some platforms. A third difference relates to business models. I think that most um, you know, incumbents in, in network industries had a pretty similar uh, business model. Um, you know, they were uh, owning the infrastructure and we're making money selling services. And then after regulation, they made also money by providing, you know, wholesale uh, um, offers. If you look at digital platforms, you've got many different business models. I think the main difference is probably between the ad funded uh, business model, which is used by, by Google and Facebook, for example, and the commission based business model, which is typically used by e-commerce platforms such as Amazon. But there can be other differences. Uh, for example, some services are fee-based. Think about cloud computing. And in some cases, these platforms are also making a lot of money through hardware, uh, which is the case of Apple, for example. So the business models tend to vary quite a bit. And as we'll discuss later, that makes regulation a bit more difficult. Uh, the false difference is that um, you know, typically network industries were, uh, sing were one-sided, um, whereas in the case of digital platforms, they tend to be two-sided, which again, adds an element of difficulty when you think about controlling their market power. And the final difference, uh, there are probably more differences, but these are those I've identified, um, is that in the case of, uh, you know, uh, um, traditional network industries, I mean, you really had an issue of vertical integration, which may be true as well with platforms, but with platforms, you have vertical integration, but you have also ecosystem effects, which are a bit more complex, right? So um, I, I think that there might be a need to make a difference between traditional vertical integration and the creation of ecosystems. There are certainly similarities, but also some differences. I'm almost at the end uh, of my uh, sort of initial presentation. I think that um, when you think about the tools that can be used to regulate, well, these tools are quite, you know, identical uh, today as they were 25 years ago or 30 years ago. I mean, you've got essentially two weapons. One is antitrust and the other one is 
regulation. When it comes to digital platforms, not all issues relate to vertical integration. Uh, for example, if you think about the App Store, one of the most discussed issues is the extent to which companies like Apple or Google can impose their in-app payment uh, uh, system. Uh, this is something that app developers are not happy about. Well, it's not really a problem of vertical integration. It's more a problem of tying or, you know, um, sort of unfair practices. But if you look at the competition cases that have been pursued by the European Commission, they pretty much all relate to vertical integration. Uh, they are really traditional vertical integration related cases. I mean, think about the, the various Google cases very much about vertical integration. Think about the Amazon case, very much about vertical integration. Think about the uh, investigation against Apple that was triggered by Spotify, very much a question of, of vertical integration. And a criticism that I hear quite often from the commission is that about the commission and their policies that they can only do vertical integration cases, whereas in fact, the issues are sometimes different. Not everything can be framed in terms of vertical integration. So I think I've said enough, uh, and now we'll just leave it here. Thank you, Damien. Um, maybe we'll hear from Alexandre now, and, and then from Silke, and then we'll, um, we'll hear, we'll see if there are questions or comments. Alexandre? Yes, thank you very much um, for, for, the, for the invitation. So what I have tried to do is what, what are the characteristics which are uh, maybe justifying regulation? And, and as Damien has said, some are the same, some are different from the, um, let's say, the traditional industry we know. And at the end of the day, I think the closest uh, traditional industry we know is um, television, as you mentioned, Valérie, before. I mean, because there we had the diversity of business model. We have also an, an, uh, an implication on society and democracy. So I think to some extent, um, there are some strong parallels to be done. But if we look at the economic characteristics, um, and then I will come more to the societal element, but to the economic characteristic, I think some characteristics of the digital platform are the same, but are exacerbated, and are the same that what we had in the traditional industry, but they are exacerbated. It's in particular um, the economies of scale and scope, which are more extreme maybe here than in traditional network industry. Um, we had net network effect, and as Damien was mentioning, this uh, multi-sidedness, which is here, again, uh, an exacerbation of the network effect. And then we have uh, clearly more rapid and, and sometimes at times unpredictable innovation. So those are the things that we had before, but they, they are um, you know, um, accelerated here. And then we have new elements. One that um, um, Damien mentioned um, already, and that is um, the conglomeration. And I, I think it's better to speak about conglomerate, uh, digital conglomerate than vertical integration. And, and that is perfectly justified to have those uh, uh, conglomerate. I mean, you, you have a lot of uh, economic rationalism, not just the ego of the funders, uh, which wants to, to, to dominate every market, but you have a, an economic logic there because on the, um, on the supply side to on the on the firm side let's say you have a lot of um, synergies in um, innovation capabilities so you can use for instance one data to develop one service and the same data to develop a very different service so that's on the on the firm side the supply side and then more on the consumer side uh, there is uh, as we know a lot of synergies um, uh, in if you are part of one single ecosystem so so that is i think a, a new element that you didn't have before and the, the, the previous conglomerate we had uh, were uh, less justified than what we have now. And then the second thing, and, and that is linked also to this conglomeralism, is the data-driven advantage. This is very new um, because of the development of big data and AI, and, and, and that is a new dimension uh, that we should take into account. So that is for the economic characteristic. For the more, um, let's say, societal characteristics, what we have here and there, there is maybe some parallels to be done with uh, the traditional network industries is that a lot of those no um, um, digital platform, digital conglomerate, are managing a kind of infrastructure which are delivering service of general interest. Because I think we can say safely say no, that search, uh, that social network, and, and maybe in the future health uh, or education are service of general interest. And the more and more they are delivered through those uh, through the digital platform. So that's one thing. And another thing uh, which has been very obvious 
um, uh, with the uh, uh, capital uh, insurrection um, in the US at the beginning of the year is the impact of um, those digital platforms or some of them uh, on, on, on um, politics and democracy. So um, I think because of those um, different characteristics, economics, some being newer, some being older but accelerated and a societal characteristic, it is very normal, it is very expected that in a way um, the uh, political power wants to take back control of the cyberspace. And you know, I was reading back um, again some time ago the, the famous uh, declaration of um, the independence for the cyberspace of uh, John uh, Perry Barlow, you know, which is this libertarian who, who said um, at Davos uh, 25 years ago, please leave us alone, you know, we know better than the state. You know, it's really good to reread that because clearly the promises that um, he was expecting from the, what he called the cyberspace um, did, did not deliver did not happen. And so it, it is not surprising that, you know, the states wants to, in a way, regulate that cyberspace as the states has in the past, progressively regulate the territorial spaces and then the maritime spaces, okay? So I think uh, given all of that, it's not surprising uh, that we have um, this um, call for regulation and then maybe we can discuss what kind of regulation do we need then. Thank you, Alexandre. We will hear from uh, Silke now. Yes, thank you very much um, for inviting me to this uh, distinguished panel. Um, um, I, I tried actually to do very much uh, similar, something like the two um, pre-speakers have done. So there will be some overlap, I guess, um, which shows that we don't totally disagree on these issues, which is, well, maybe not so nice for the discussion, but uh, anyhow, um, a fact. Um, what I tried to do was first to look a bit at normal vertical integrated companies market failure issues that come up and you can find those of course in 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 all kinds of cases I think um, um, Alexandre or Damien I don't quite remember who mentioned some of the the, the commission cases and and the fact that uh, they are they have been looking at quite some vertically integrated vertical integrated issues in in the big tech sector but of course, you can find such cases also in, in other sectors. Um, we've had mergers, vertical mergers, where you look at foreclosure effects, for example, which are the typical kinds of um, market failure scenarios you might you might find. Squeeze out um, um, conduct is, is, is another kind of conduct that you would be expecting from vertically integrated companies, um, raising rival cost strategies or something like this. We've been having that, for example, even in the waste industry sector and, 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 and um, others as well. So I guess it's rather obvious if you really look at vertical integration alone, and I very much agree with Alexandra that conglomerate may be more fit for, for looking at the big tech companies, but of course there are vertical effects in all of this. It's quite obvious that any threat of market failure will be higher and more significant if the market position on the markets that uh, companies are active on are stronger and more stable, less, um, less um, contestable, or maybe are still growing, which is something that we often see in the digital market. And further, um, it is, of course, in combination with this, clear that all of these kind of market failure issues can arise more easily if access to these markets that we would be looking at is limited by the structure of the market due to business models or even due to conduct by the companies that you were looking at, the incumbents. So, so what's special about the big techs? I think that um, the pre-speakers have been mentioning many, many important things. I think um, very clearly um, network effects, multi-sidedness is really something that's absolutely essential to look at and, and to see as a difference to, to other sectors, also network sectors, the intermediary position uh, that that these these platforms very often um, 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 well that they situate themselves in a, in such a position. The fact that mostly, very and very often, at least part of the business model is strongly data driven is something that's also a big difference, I guess, to normal network industries. 
um, and the fact that they become gateways between businesses and consumers or whatever the, the participating groups of, of the market uh, participants are. Um, something that um, was already mentioned is, of course, that they are moving much faster than uh, in their whole development than the, the um, network industries or other normal <laughs> sectors might have been doing in the past. And um, the um, issue of creating ecosystems where they are trying also to, to um, uh, keep their contract parties within this system and kind of exploiting more um, contract possibilities with, their, with these partners in that way, attaching more services um, to, to their maybe main service that they started with or where they have a strong position. Um, <clears throat> Um, I think that what you can see a little bit from, from the debates that have been going on and also from the remedy debates, of course, is that the, the whole issue of how uh, the importance of data for their business models is, is something that's really very essential and makes it not very easy and not so clear cut what solutions could be. Um, and then another aspect that is very often discussed in context um, with the big techs and, and what we see also when we do our cases is that they have the option for setting rules for more than only their, only, um, their own um, um, platform because of the, the strong position that they may be having. So <clears throat> um, I guess that um, 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 from the point of view of, of me and my colleagues, uh, we very much see the, the innovative um, aspects of all of these um, um, activities. And um, many of the platforms have still been growing and developing very, very good services, even though I think one of you mentioned that as well. There are, of course, also areas of their services where development has not been going on, where there is more stagnation than, than, than um, further innovation. And especially maybe in such circumstances, this is something that um, as a competition authority, you know from markets uh, to happen that um, uh, incumbents may start acting in a way, protecting their standalone position in order to safeguard that, um, which is of course also things that we see. Um, <clears throat> now, all of these, um, these aspects have been, uh, one of well reasons for for the the last amendment in in Germany of of the law and creating new uh, competences for the Bundeskartellamt um, and a, a, a last issue I'd like to mention in that context is that um, um, the speed of the market development is something that um, um, the legislator in Germany has seen as a reason to create new uh, tools, competition or regulation tools, that's something we can discuss later on what this is, in order to um, enable authorities to just react and, and to or, or to, to, yeah, to these developments faster than this is possible with, with normal competition law. Thank you. Thank you, Selke. I don't know if um, Damien or Alexandra or Selke, do you want to react to one of the others? Um, um, I think you you agree very much on oh. on, on some of the aspects of those uh, platforms or, or those vertically integrated platforms. Um, maybe you know, trying to just narrow down. What is it? What is it that really would justify new tools? You know, uh, besides those that already exist. I, just one reaction when um, Dania, you said that most of the cases at the Commission are about uh, vertical issues. I think there are a few cases that really stick to you know to just one platform, not necessarily vertically integrated. If you think of uh, um, you know the the the, the case on with bookings.com and other cases relating to those uh, most favored nation clauses or price parity clauses where that was a way to regulate or to prevent this intermediation in a sense, uh, which is um, an issue that we discussed earlier. But um, 
I think you all agree that there are specificities, and I think those specificities, you know, indirect net network effect, the systemic nature of those platforms, in a sense, uh, their their scope. You know, they're they're not just important like one telecom operator in one country. They are they have this worldwide uh, uh, scope. Uh, which means that they they end up being very important in more than one you know more than just one country or even more than Europe. But those are also aspects I think which will make it more difficult or to regulate in a sense to intervene because of all ramifications that 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 this will uh, entail in the end. Um, I. Don't see any questions in the chat room. Is there anyone who um, would like to open his or her microphone? And okay, Jorge Padilla has a question. Um, Jorge, do you want to open your mic, or should I read your question? Ah, here you are. Uh, thank you. Okay, Jorge. I can, I can, I can do the question directly. And thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Silke, Damian, and Alexandre, in the order that I have you in the screen for having joined us today. So the, the question was the following. When we regulated telecoms, uh, we regulated a series of markets. And uh, we had a very clear mm -hmm. idea of what the problems in those markets were. These were wholesale markets, and we had an access problem, by and large. Now, it seems to me that we are now in a different situation, uh, in the sense that we're not aspiring to regulate markets, and it's not clear that we have a single problem to regulate. It appears that we have a number of concerns with particular companies. And to some extent, what we are prepared to do is to develop uh, straight jackets, which fit perfectly each of these companies. But this is not regulating markets, this is regulating companies. And, and this is to some extent exposed rather than ex ante because the uh, way in which we cut these or tailor these jackets depends on how they behave uh, and, and how they will behave as opposed to you know something that a pattern of behavior that we have seen repeatedly in certain market in a certain market that is a matter of concern do you agree with uh, these uh, uh, propositions do you disagree and do you think it matters or 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 this is uh, a nice philosophical reflection, but of totally relevance from the viewpoint of day-to-day -day regulation. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to start. <clears throat> Thank you, Jorge, for the, for the question. I mean, I agree with you. Um, I think things are, are much more complicated today than they, they were in the past. And it's because, you know, these companies are, are systemic in nature, right? I mean, you know, Typically, 25 years ago, you had France Telecom in France and uh, Belgacom in Belgium, and they were doing uh, their business um, locally. They were, they had essentially one or two line of businesses, and and so it was not that difficult to identify the problems. Although the solutions, uh, we should remember, were highly contentious. I, I still remember. Uh, you know, the, the very, very hot debates that took place in the 80s and 90s about, about what could, could, be, could be done. Um, I think you can also see the difficulty by, by the different type of solutions that are elaborated, for example, by the European Commission, um, by uh, the UK government, and by the US Congress. Uh, for example, the, the Commission decided to go for a single regulation, which will you know, deal with lots of different things. Uh, the, the British decided to go for uh, approaches that are more sectoral in nature with codes of conduct. And in the US, it's a mix of both, where you have some bills that are horizontal in nature and others that really focus on one, uh, um, you know, group of actors, such as, for example, the Open App Markets Act, which is really focusing on app stores. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. Um, maybe I can just, um, I, Jorge, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I think on both your points, first of all, that um, 
in a sense, even though I guess it didn't seem so at the time, but uh, the, 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 the question of what needs to be regulated in the network industries is at least seems from, from the view that we have today so simple to define what we needed there. Uh, it, it was about access. And of course, there are many, many gritty nitty details. There are also issues of price regulation, which are not easy. I'm not blaming or saying that anybody's not understood its job or whatever, but it's um, still absolutely simple compared to what, what the question is that we are facing now with these companies, uh, with these big uh, ecosystems. And so, yes, I this is, is, is really, I think, a very important point. Um, furthermore, I, I also agree that uh, with you that the issue here is very much um, a look at companies and not so much at sectors, because none of us would be able to define what the sector is if you say it's digital companies, then nobody wants to regulate all of them. Everybody is looking at a group of companies and it needs to be defined. Somehow they need to be selected or defined these companies. And there are different me uh, methods, the, the different approaches at the European level, in, in the US, in the UK or in Germany, how, how we are trying to narrow down to the relevant ones. Um, and the question of whether this is maybe just was one thing I, I wouldn't totally agree with you is whether we are developing straight jackets for all of them. You are right that, and this is especially the, the, the result of all the discussions we've been having in Germany is that at least we think there is not one size fits all of that straight jacket or how you might want to call it, because the business models of all those that you would be thinking of are too different, uh, even though they have similarities, of course, and all the aspects that the characteristics that we have been talking about might arise with all of them or with most of them in, in many of their activities. But still, you can't compare, I don't know, for example, Amazon, or you can't say Amazon is the same as Google. It's just not the case. So we need to look at them uh, case by case. And then this is, I, I like that very much, Jorge, because this debate about ex post and ex ante always tends to make me a bit angry because I think it's not the issue. <laughs> it's just not the issue. And it's not also not the question what in competition law is ex post and ex ante. There are many prohibitions in competition law that, of course, have an ex ante effect, even though any procedure of enforcing such a prohibition might be exposed. Uh, and I think this is very much the same with what we are talking about here. Um, all of this leads to the result in Germany that we think we should not have a one size fits all set of prohibitions. Um, we, we think it is necessary to be able to, to um, develop this regime with the development of the of the sector or of these companies of the, of the addressees of these new tools because they will continue to develop why shouldn't they they have been doing so very intensely in in the last years and so we need some something between clarity and flexibility Yes, maybe I will um, give you a few minutes, Alexandre. Uh, I know that Martin uh, would like to um, to uh, ask questions, and um, and the person who raised his or her hand. Uh, but maybe Alexandre, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I just want to 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 add two two elements to the debate. So um, I, I understand the criticism of your gay, but but I think it's a bit harsh in a way. <laughs> Because I think the Commission has identified um, the two relevant objectives in, in the endeavor of the DMA, which is contestability and fairness. Now, I agree that it's not very clearly defined and maybe not enough thought through. But I mean, if you can, and in a, in a, in a paper with Pierre Larouche, we have tried to reread all those obligations according to this objective first of contestability to ensure innovation. Okay, and a lot of obligation that you have or prohibition that you have in Article 5 and 6 will really help, and we try to show that in the paper, will really help 
um, sustaining innovation by the user of the platform and disruptive innovation by complementer or new entrants. So maybe it was not thought through enough and that's, that's a weakness of the proposal, but, but it goes in the right direction. So that's for the contestability for innovation. And then on the fairness element, again, I agree that it's maybe not very well defined, but there is an element of, re, I mean, of re-establishing um, um, to be sure that the added value which is created by those platforms and which undeniable that the, this added value is shared more fairly among the different stakeholders. So I really think that the, the objective out there maybe not sufficiently thought through, not sufficiently explained, but um, it's, it's, we go are going in the, in the right direction. Now on the point of um, um, case by case or, or, or straight jacket, I see the point of, of um, case by case and of standard instead of detailed rule, but we should never forget that when you have a new law, you know, it's extremely complicated to enforce. And maybe, you know, in the first stage of the law, to have a detailed rule are maybe better in this first stage than open standard. And then once uh, the um, regulator have expertise and experience, then you can move to standard. And in fact, to go back to a comparison uh, with an industry we, we, we like a lot and we know uh, well, um, all of us, this is telecom. You know, We started, if you go back to the very old uh, 97 uh, ONP directive, open network provision, they were super based on detailed rule. You know, The market were predefined in the directive all the obligation were in the directive. And then it's only in 2002 when uh, the regulator had sufficiently expertise and experience that we move towards, um, uh, towards more uh, open standard. So I think you know, you have to, we have to have a kind of a dynamic um, perspective of, um, of the law here. And the, the last element I want to, to say, uh, to answer to Valérie, your question about um, why what we have now is not good enough. I mean, what we have now is mainly antitrust. And antitrust is slow, but I think that's not the, mo the most of the problem. I think antitrust is not good at remedy, not good at all at remedy for those kind of issues when you need behavior remedy, which needs a constant monitoring. So I, I really think that the rationale of antitrust may be good, but the way you monitor remedy with antitrust is not good at all. Thank you, Alexandre. Martin, would you like to, to, to ask your questions and then it's it's actually one question hopefully um i i want I, so i'm a narrow-minded economist and uh you see i, I of course underline and un, like the discussion on on ecosystems and so on but i mean this workshop is on vertical integration i think there are vertical integration issues and we have seen in the first panel the models are simple so either uh, the platform owner provides a, a product or service itself it has a marketplace or is it's, it runs in dual mode. The world is in, in a way richer, but that's fine. Models are abstractions, but I'm, since you are in the real world more, um, I'm wondering how should we deal with the ever shifting boundaries of the degrees of vertical uh, integration uh, in those platforms? Take Amazon. Uh, Amazon doesn't just have its own products and the independent sellers as our simple models do, but the world of course is much richer. They have Amazon vendors, so some services are provided by, by Amazon, uh, others are still provided by the sellers, so they are shifting degrees of vertical integration. Um, how should uh, regulation in some sense catch up uh, with these uh, different levels of uh, vertical integration. That's yeah, a good question. <laughs> That's a good question, and I I would say that um, uh, if you look at the the DMA, um, you see that there are a lot of rules trying to remedy the basically the the symptoms or the outcomes of vertical integration. Right? Um, these are, you know, behavioral remedies. You, you shouldn't do this or you should do that. What is lacking in my view are, you know, remedies that were used in network industries and they may be simpler, such as functional separation, for example, right? I mean, if you think about the app store and I know less about Amazon, but I could imagine that, you know, you could, you could also, um, I mean, there are many analogies, if you think about the App Store, 
one of the problems is that, um, well, the same people that run the app store are also those that take decisions about products, right? And, and, and so it's unavoidable that you end up with undesirable outcomes from a competition law standpoint, right? And Apple is admitted to that. I mean, in litigation, you know, they, they admit it in the positions that there's no Chinese wall or separation of any kind. And that, you know, executives on the platform side, you know, talk to executives on the product side and vice versa, and they just share information. So perhaps, you know, we should go back to simpler remedies. What about some form? I mean, you can go extreme and, you know, say, well, you can't be at the same time a platform and someone competing on the platform. And some of the US bills are going in that direction, right? But um, you can also have some more limited um, uh, forms of, of separation, like functional separation, these sort of things. Um, and I'm a little bit surprised that they're not considered, at least in the DNA. Uh, perhaps the UK will, will go you know, in a different direction uh, with codes of conduct and pro-competition uh, interventions. Can I just uh, um, complement that? Because um, in a way, we had the same debate, I, I mentioned as, uh, as Damien mentioned, um, 20 years ago for the network industry. And the choices were made differently, depending on uh, different network industries. So for instance, it is true that in electricity or in, in rail, um, it, uh, the, 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 the policy choice was for um, a form of separation, while in telecom, it was decided at the beginning, at least, to, to continue to have an integrated um, telecom network, but then to open it, okay? And that was the open network provision uh, program. I think here what the commission has decided is to, to take more the telecom model than the energy model or, or the uh, railways model. Why? I think in, in the telecom, the, the, the commission did not propose a structural separation for two reasons. One, because there was, a kind of, there was a kind of political opposition which was too strong, and we should remember that the telecom was one of the first network industry to be liberalized. So I think the commission didn't have enough political capital to, to require a structural separation, but also there was an element to say, okay, there is so much synergies between uh, the, um, um, let's say the, 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 the running of the network and the running of the services and probably higher than in, in other network industry that we, we, we don't want to lose those synergies. And I guess that um, the synergies here in, in digital may be even higher than in telecom. So, so personally, I'm not so much a fan of uh, structural remedy, uh, not in terms of merger. I agree that maybe we should be much stricter on merger once, but, but once um, the company is already integrated, I'm not so sure that at this stage at least, uh, structural separation, given the synergies that you have uh, between the different um, side or, or, or level, uh, would, would be justified. And so that's thing, I think that's why the, the choice of the commission, which is more an opening the platform, is at least in the first stage better. Now, if that is not working, then maybe we can uh, have the discussion again in five years. So I think we already actually started discussing about uh, regulatory design and implementation. And uh, this is you know, the introduction of our second part. <laughs> so I don't know if you had prepared um, um, uh, Silke, Alex, and uh, Alexandre and Damien, Another, you know, uh, little bit to discuss on this. On my, why I introduced that this is my second part on, um, you know, uh, regulatory design and implementation. Um, you know, against the background that we have discussed, uh, see whether what is proposed in in the different proposals seems fit to you. So uh, we've already discussed that. We agree that there are different many different issues, many different problems that we want to try to address at the same time, which uh, makes it very complicated. And that indeed this, this uh, uh, one size fits all is probably uh, not realistic and will not work. And, um, and maybe we then discuss what, uh, what type of um, remedies as Alexandre have introduced a type of remedies might be better suited for you know vertically integrated digital platforms relative to other type of uh, vertically inter integrated firms. So Silke, do, do, would you like to 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 give us um, um, 
a little bit of um, of your thoughts on the, on those issues. Yes, yes. Um, actually, I, I had wanted to start with uh, looking once more at the network industries, which we've already discussed, so I'll just skip that part um, and maybe uh, just try to explain a bit about the debates we've been having in Germany, which actually are in, in, uh, in the forefront of, of the recent regulation, because I think that actually that debate rather, well, shows the 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 issues that need to be answered if you want to introduce any new tools so basically um i think um of course the question at the time was very much um uh, how much ex ante or ex post you might be putting into any new tools and how specific or how um explicit they should be in the, if you if you uh, introduce new prohibitions for example and i think that what we have been doing in germany is is actually first of all trying to 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 find a key word for the companies that we might want to address and we've found this wording which at the time when, when the, the the draft came up i remember many uh, debates on conferences where people said this is a really very difficult wording and nobody knows particularly what you are talking about and it's very long and you can't really find a good appreciation for it either that is the paramount significant significance of these companies for competition across markets and Yes, it's difficult, but we have tried to capture the, the phenomenon that we think that needs to be addressed. And I guess also this, this wording shows that um, this, of course, applies to companies with, which are virtually, vertically integrated, but not only that. It goes beyond uh, pure or simple vertical integration. Um, and the second question then was, um, what kind of um, remedies or what kind of prohibitions should we go for? Um, this was a very long debate. And in the end, we, we ended up with um, a mixture of, of general prohibitions, which allow um, different uh, conducts to be um, um, summarized under them and examples, very specific examples um, more of the sort that you will be finding in the DMA as specific prohibitions for all companies. Now, then the next step was the question is, how is this supposed to be applied in the sector or to these companies? And there also we had a long debate. And in the end, we chose for, um, um, or the choice was to, to have the authority designate companies that fulfill the criteria of having paramount significance for competition across markets. So that is a decision in a first step, uh, which allows um, not having to define these companies or the group of companies you're looking at in the law uh, um, clearly, which we found was very difficult to do. Um, and secondly, then in order to be able to um, come up with a, um, a tool that does not make a straight jacket for all companies in the same way um, what we are going what, what what we are now able to do is after having designated these companies is that we can um, activate prohibitions uh, for specific conduct against specific companies which allows us to to make a choice of where the problems are greatest and uh, we do not have to apply the prohibitions to all companies in the same way on all their activities, which we found or um, and the debate in Germany uh, came to the conclusion that that would not be uh, a good thing for innovation and also for, for getting grips on, on the problems in these markets. Um, and the last point um, is that we saw a necessity to introduce some kind of objectively just objective justification from the point of view from the companies in order to at least have a certain opening for cases where these prohibitions just do not fulfill their, their aim. Um, um, and the last point we addressed uh, was the question of speed in proceedings, um, which led amongst others to 
um, a reduction of the levels of appeal to with regard to the decisions that the, the Bundeskartellamt will be able to take. So you can see it, it has a bit of everything, um, 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 especially in, co in, in, in with regard to the kind of remedies, the sort of designation that you have, and the the activation or the the creating of a a, a regime that fits to the company in question. Um, um, maybe just one um, comment on on the question of any functional separation. I think we haven't been addressing that in 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 the national German law. Um, personally, I guess this is, of course in itself a difficult debate which is easier for United States people to, to discuss than for Europeans. I think um, in Europe there's a more general reluctance on, on separating companies or even um, separating their services. And this seems to be a measure that would be a, a, a measure of last resort. Um, maybe also then as a national competition or a national legislator and the competition regime, it makes very much sense in, the, in, in, a, in this scenario here that it's not a national authority separating companies, but that would be something for the European level. Thank you. Alexandre. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I try to go to to go back to the telecom framework because that that's the one I know best and, and what we can learn from from here. Um, the um, the first thing is in terms of objective, and there I, I will address also the the, the question by Jorge and the, and the answer by by Damien. I, and I agree with Damien. I I don't think that the point here is to 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 have a kind of a inter-platform competition through a ladder of investment because I mean that's not what really uh, the DMA is and should be about creating an, an, another Facebook or another, uh, another uh, Google search. I think the point is to open the market to have the ability um, of having a new services, a kind of disruptive innovation, which could, as Damien was saying, um, uh, completely um, bypass um, the other, um, the existing services. So I think that is the objective. Now, the other question that uh, Jorge had is, then what is the end, end game of regulation? No, I think the, the easy answer is that there is no end game in regulation in general. Uh, that's what we learned from experience. So this is why we are all here and investing a lot in the DMA because the DMA is here to stay. Um, but it's true that I, I, I'm not sure at which point you could say, okay, the market is suffi sufficiently contestable and fair that you don't need regulation. So I guess here, the regulation is really here to stay to maintain those um, uh, two objective contestability and fairness. Um, the second point um, I have already discussed is the issue of rule versus standard. Um, and uh, as I said, I think it's very good in the first generation of a law, when, and the DMA is at its first generation, to base mostly on rule and not so much on standard because they are too complicated to enforce. Now, um, this is why I think um, the European proposal is in a way better than um, other proposals which are only based on standard. Now, that do not mean that we don't need to complement those a very detailed prohibition and, 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 and obligation with some standard, but I think it would be good to maintain some uh, detailed rule, um, at least in a, in a first stage. Then the third element is in terms of remedy. And we already discussed that as well. Um, I think uh, the issue here and probably the DMA do not insist enough on interoperability and interconnection. So you have some indeed detailed obligation which relate to some form of um, interoperability, uh, but that's, that is too limited. And this is why I think uh, we need to complement those detailed rules with maybe a more general standard uh, regarding uh, interoperability and interconnection as it has been proposed um, in uh, several other law um, and, and in particular in the, in the US. So, so there indeed uh, there is some um, improvement that could be done uh, in the DMA and the, the, the amendment that had been tabled by um, uh, the so-called friend of the DMA, uh, so they, they have some proclaimed themselves friend of the DMA, so you should always be suspicious, but I think their amendment, so the, 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 the French, uh, the Germany and, 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 and the Netherlands have amendment in that direction and I think it's good. And then the last element is on institution and what we learn from, from telecom regulation is that you need, because it will be extremely complicated to do, and if there is one thing that I 
uh, have understood from the previous panel is that all of that is very complicated. Uh, so um, Martin seems to say that it's simple models, but even those simple models uh, seems to um, give complicated answer. And so you would need to have um, a regulator which are, I think, specialized um, and not necessarily, therefore, a general antitrust authority. Uh, and secondly, that um, it should be a, a collaborative regulation. So uh, we, we know about collaborative antitrust, but I think here really, uh, more than ever, it could not only be a kind of dialogue between the commission and the regulated gatekeeper, as it is proposed currently in the DMA, it should be much more collaborative, involving the national authority, of course, but also um, the other stakeholders, the potential competitor, the user, in a much more um, explicit way uh, than it is now. Otherwise, it will it will not work. So, so basically, I think the DMA is much, at this stage at least, is uh, too much model on a antitrust mode of enforcement, while we really need a kind of regulatory mode of enforcement. Yeah. Thank you, Alexandre. Okay, my, my own two cents. I mean, if you want to, to cut through the chase, I think uh, if you speak about design, three things matter. I mean, there, there are three critical elements, um, I would think. The first one is scope. Who do you want to regulate? And you've got different options. Um, either you take a, a sort of horizontal approach like the commission did with the GDPR and the B2B regulation. And I don't think these were major successes because I think it didn't necessarily control uh, the companies that were most problematic, but created significant hassle uh, uh, for uh, smaller operators. Also, um, you know, uh, enforcement has been totally deficient. And, and in fact, you know, you would need a regulator with, with literally thousands of people to even begin to scratch the sort of number of complaints uh, they're, they're dealing with. Um, also, if you have a wide scope, uh, then uh, you tend to dilute uh, the stringency of the rules. And that's why I think the, the, the European Commission has learned uh, from that and has decided to focus on a small subset of companies. I don't think that something horizontal would have been acceptable uh, anymore. Um, and I agree with that, with that approach. And, and in fact, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, more comfortable with that approach when I see that the Americans do exactly the same. Uh, it, it's even more focused. If you look at the thresholds, it's $600 billion, right? I mean, <laughs> I think Europe is just 65. So it's, you know, there they really target, uh, uh, you know, essentially five companies, whereas if you think about the DMA, it could capture a few more. Um, so that's scope. Then you've got, you have to decide whether you go for a rules-based approach or a principle-based approach. And, and there you can see differences. I mean, I, I mean, you know, as, as Alexandre mentioned, it seems that the DMA is at least initially focusing on rules. Whereas if you look at the UK approach, the focus more on principles. Now, at the end of the day, they may end up with rules as well. If you look at the codes of conduct, I suppose they will be fairly detailed, right? So perhaps the legislation that will be adopted by the UK government following consultation uh, will be something that is fairly broad, focusing on principles. Uh, but then at the end of the day, you know, you may have a code of conduct on you know, search engine and one on app stores and one on e-commerce platforms that will be fairly granular. Uh, I don't see how you could do it differently. So perhaps you will end up with rules. Uh, and then, you know, the final question is enforcement. And I think that, that once again, you can go for different approaches. I mean, you can either set up a regulator um, and um, uh, that, that seems to be what, what the UK is doing with the, the DMU, which is located within the, the DMA. If you look at the US bills, um, I mean, I don't think they intend to create a regulator. I mean, they, they will rely essentially on the FTC and, and, and also on, on, on litigation. And, and uh, um, so, so I, I don't think they're considering the, the creation of a digital regulator. When you look at the DMA, um, it's not clear yet. I mean, I think that the commission is thinking about, you know, having some unit uh, with 60 FTEs, you know, uh, it, what a joke. I mean, you know, these 50, 60 people will be completely overwhelmed. I think, I think 600 would be closer to the mark. 
And, 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 uh, but I don't think that the member states want that. And, and I think we will end up probably with, with indeed, uh, I mean, hopefully more than 60 people at the commission focusing probably more on implementation, you know, uh, designation of gatekeepers and then the regulatory dialogue. And then enforcement might be, you know, uh, um, a sort of shared competence with, with the member states, uh, with then a mechanism that would be close to the, um, you know, uh, uh, ECN uh, that we know with respect to, to competition authorities. So it, it shows that, I mean, I, I think that when you think about design, I mean, there are not that many big issues to, to deal with, uh, but I mean, you need to know exactly what you, what you want uh, and choices can, can be made differently depending on, on, on jurisdiction. Although I think at the end of the day, we may end up with things that are fairly similar um, um, in, in, for example, the EU and, and the UK. Thank you, Damien. I would like to ask something or you know, to give you some of my thoughts. So in the previous panel, we've heard um, you know, uh, four pieces of research, which I found really interesting for many reasons. One of these reasons showing that, first of all, vertically integrated digital platforms can and often do benefit uh, consumers that uh, we've seen also that you know so some of those papers indicate that some of the obligations that are discussed in the policy arena, such as, for example, uh, forbidding dual roles, preventing uh, self-preferencing, uh, making you know a disclosure of consumers' information mandatory, et cetera, et cetera. Some of some of this research shows that it might not it might be detrimental to consumers and the effect on competitors is not even very clear okay and i'm saying that because i know that it, well i find that the dma sometimes seems to be more preoccupied with the welfare of competitors rather than the the consumer surplus so no given that you know this research is quite recent First of all, so from the you know academic perspective, yes, the, 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 there's there are now a lot of very good people working on, on very interesting issues, but empirically, you know, we we don't have that much experience yet, that much evidence. We're dealing with those companies with you know many many ramifications, which means that if you if you try to regulate one one or two segments of this platform, it will, it will have knock-on effects on other parts of the business and on other segments or markets, if we want to say. So my concern is, is, is a little bit this, is the sort of the rigidity that I see in, in, in the DMA in, the, in how it dictates rules, very specific rules, you know, if you look at the Article 5, uh, article, uh, is it five? Yeah, five and six of the DMA, very specific about very specific behaviors that are supposed to apply to all gatekeepers. Okay. So I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, all knock on effects it will have or uh, consequences it may have that we have, that we have not anticipated or that the, the commission has not properly taken the time to identify and anticipate. How do you respond to that? I can start again. I mean, that is, of course, something that you hear a lot from, uh, you know, the, the companies that are likely to be designated gatekeepers. Uh, and I'm not surprised they're saying that. And there might be an element of, of truth in it. Um, um, now, um, I think that uh, it's. I, I agree with with Alexandre. I think that you need to have you have you need to have some rules. One 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 aspect that I I'd like to mention is that the Commission did not help itself with the approach taken. 
because he decided indeed to have a set of rules, right? Uh, that would, in theory at least, apply to all digital gatekeepers. And you've got very different animals in the list of gatekeepers. So personally, I like better the UK approach, which would be to focus, for example, on app stores or search engines or e-commerce platforms, because these are well-recognized animals that create well-recognized problems and trying to have a minimum set of rules uh, or a set of rules that could potentially apply to companies with different, different business model is difficult. And you can see that with the drafting. But you can already see that some member states have, have seen that. And if you look, for example, at the recent uh, joint paper from the French, the German and the Dutch government, they want to introduce a new article, which would be Article 16A in the DMA that would allow them to, that would allow the commission to step in to adopt tailored remedies. So I think they realize that, you know, a set of rule, a, 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 you know, a given set of rules applying to companies with different business model is complicated. It will stay in the DMA because I don't think that you know, moving away from five axes is something that is politically feasible. I think the governments and most of the people in the parliament are attached to that. And I think it's too late to, to, to move away from that. But you really see that the member states are trying to integrate some elements of the UK approach. And in fact, if you look at the language, it's literally a cut and paste from some UK policy documents. I just would like to, to, and if you're interested, read my blog, the Platform Law blog, a bit of publicity. I have a discussion on that and on this joint paper. Now, just one element that I wanted to mention, because that's something that struck me with the DMA, is the lack, is, is the failure to take into account what you could, could call, you know, the learnings from behavioral economics or behavioral psychology. For example, take 5A. 5A is a stupid provision. It says digital gatekeepers can aggregate data, you know, coming from different services, except when users give consent. I mean, by, by this stage, you should know that users, including me, give consent because you can just, you know, listen, essentially bully them until they give consent. So having a rule that applies, except if the digital gatekeepers, you know, can, uh, I, mean, I mean, can obtain consent is a rule that has no teeth. And I, 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 I've tried to explain that to many people, but nobody seems to, to understand. And I think because this notion of consent is so core to the GDPR, which has become a religion rather than, than, than any normal piece of legislation that they don't want to listen. Defaults, for example, the power of defaults is not something that is really considered in the DMA. So I think that, you know, all the learnings that come from economics and psychology seem to be ignored. But that's a different problem, but I, I still wanted to make the point. Thank you. Can I, can I compliment on that? Um, so I couldn't agree more that this is, a, this is something which where the commission didn't score very well. I mean, this behavioral economics and, and the power of def default. So hopefully it will be corrected during the negotiation. I also agree very much with the previous thing that Damien uh, said about uh, the asymmetric uh, rule. I mean, and, and but I think what we have, what we have to have here is a double asymmetry, an asymmetry in terms of the obligation. So the obligation should only focus on the biggest one, but also an asymmetry in terms of enforcement. And this is uh, why I, I like a lot the centralized enforcement or the fact that it's the commission. You know, okay, there is some maybe not enough staff and there I agree, but it's good that it's centralized. And in fact, what we have here is what we have for the systemic bank. You know, The biggest bank in uh, Europe are uh, supervised not by the national supervisor, but by, uh, by the ECB. So I, I think this double, this double asymmetry is very good. Now to come to your uh, point, uh, uh, Valérie, um, I agree with you, but we should be nuanced here. Um, first, not all the obligation apply to all the business model. Okay, so some obligation are business model specific in the way they are drafted, and in fact, half of them. 
So um, only half of the 18 are really uh, business model agnostic. I would say. Mm. So, so we have to be also, we have to recognize that um, um, in, in the commission drafting. But you're right that uh, we, we may make mistake and we, I mean, surely some mistake will be made. Okay, surely uh, you will have some now uh, type type one error. Maybe we had in the past too many type two error. Maybe some type one error will be made. This is why it's very important. And that is maybe a bit missing in um, the system, a kind of a feedback loop where you learn from experience and then you can correct, you know, uh, the um, uh, the obligation. And I think the, the system which which you have now in, in, the, in the law is a bit too heavy. For instance, I don't see a way of re-specifying an obligation after one or two years, you know. Yes, there is a possibility to add new obligation, but there is no possibility to remove obligation or to re-specify an obligation after. So, so I think on, on that, um, that would be important maybe to have a better uh, feedback loop when you can learn and adapt from experience. In particular, again, because we are in the first generation of this law. And then on, the, on your last, on the other critique, which is to say, um, this is protecting more competitor uh, than uh, um, consumer or user. There, I would slightly disagree. I think there is a kind of time frame here, and maybe something may be good for um, the short term, but bad in the long term. And I think what the DMA is is doing is more betting on the long term, and this is why they are so concerned about contestability than on the on the short term. And the last point, um, I think all the um, obligations that have been mentioned in the previous panel, the economic panel, um, this is something which is not prohibited by the DMA. So I was relatively reassured um, listening to that panel. So for instance, there is no prohibition of dual, um, dual um, business model in the DMA. There is no obligation to share your data with, uh, uh, with all, the, um, all the, the competitors. So I think the two main, let's say, obligation which were discussed in the previous panel are not in the DMA. So I think I was in, in fact reassured by that panel um, showing that in a, in a way the DMA is relatively well targeted and, and better than I thought, in fact, before the panel. Thank you, but I, I agree what, what, what lacks in the DMA, because what I find is that we may, when the DMA was drafted, it was, it was drafted really quickly, so that, you know, that's good, but also, it, you know, it, it is at the risk of um, having overlooked a, a lot of uh, development from the legal or economic literature, and um, knowledge is being built currently. And we will know more probably in two or three years. And I, I agree with you. What is what I find is missing is this flexibility to to revise this piece of this piece of legislation regularly and more you know being more adaptable uh, to to a very to a very very dynamic uh, markets and 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 um, operators. So yeah, I agree with you. Did you... I mean, maybe uh, just to, to jump in once, uh, as I explained, that's why we did it a bit differently in Germany. I think it touches on all these points that you have mentioned, the, the flexibility of prohibitions, um, um, being able to tailor the, 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 the um, scope of a prohibition to, to a specific um, circumstance and getting into a debate with the company on, on the, and of course, not only with them, I mean, our procedures, we don't only discuss with the incumbents that we are dealing with, we are discussing with a lot of people, stakeholders of all kinds in order to find out what now would be a, a right measure. Um, Maybe just, uh, and I very much agree with that we are all still learning and um, I wasn't able to listen to all of the panel this afternoon, but um, I, I am very happy that these panels are taking place and these papers are being written because we didn't have that before starting this debate on legislation. I, I'm, we are all learning huh? and I, I would say that if you see that you are learning, then maybe not quite so explicit prohibitions would have been a good choice uh, in order to be able to adapt to the things that we are still learning. Um, um, maybe this issue of um, 
um, asking for consent by the user, the, the, the relationship with the GDPR is, is an example of that as well. Uh, um, um, of course, if, if a user gives consent, then it is an issue of proportionality, whether you can really say this is irrelevant. Um, and I agree very much with you that these companies know very well how to um, um, get people to consent to these kind of um, questions, uh, but but um, you can't, well, it's, I guess, maybe one of the, the, um, the um, how do you say this, the, the, the ways of, of drafting law in Europe that we kind of learn in, on, on the job a little bit on what kind of um, prohibitions would be proportional, would fit, and how, how you should be drafting them. Um, I guess that some way of um, uh, some some mechanism of uh, justification by the companies would have been helpful. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to react, ask a question, or make a comment? In the chat, there is a parallel debate. Uh, I think that relates to the <laughs> to the the previous discussion. Uh, so there are two uh, parallel threads, but a little bit um, uh, on, on a different topic. So if anyone has a... Um, so I see, I mean, see perhaps from Carboni, oh, who has a, a hand raise still for, has had a hand raise for a while. So now you can, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much for allowing me to ask this question and thank you for this opportunity. I'm from Taylor Wessing, so we have a heavy focus advising clients from the digital industry. And my question to uh, Ms. Hossenfelder would be, do you think the the, the recent German uh, amendment of the GWB, the National Competition Act, has, has been sufficient for now or do you think further regulatory steps are needed to address the problem? Do you think uh, in terms of regulation, have we gone far enough in Germany right now? And do you think it is the right approach to insert this into general competition law as we have done in Germany, basically the same general instrument, but inserting specific provisions to deal with these digital Eric giants, really. Okay, so I think, um, um, yes, I would say that the choice of putting that in competition law um, in uh, Germany was the right choice because um, um, I think that competition authorities and competition law is actually the, the area of law in, in regulating markets that is best placed to find out what kind of regulatory regime might be workable. Um, I think that we've been discussing on, on, on the experiences that um, regulatory authorities have been gathering, but they always had a very clear frame. Um, as we have been talking about, uh, it was about um, 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 designing a good way to, to, to regulate access to networks, for example, and that's where they have experience in, but at least I would say that in Germany, uh, dealing with the digital sector is something where the competition authority and also the competition law regime is, is the most well-placed thing that we have, let's put it that way, to, 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 to at least to start dealing with this. Nobody in Germany, I think, would say that this is the end of what we need as, as tools. Um, and then, of course, uh, you should also take into, always take into account that Germany is not doing these things totally on its own. We are part of the European Union. The, the European Union is currently talking about the DMA. And of course, these, these pieces of legislation will interact in some way. We will have to find a way to see how we work alongside or together on, on these kind of uh, cases. So I don't know whether it's going to be sufficient, um, but I think this is something nobody can say with regard to the DMA either. So we are um, working on finding out, um, um, gathering knowledge on the way these 
these um, markets or these services, these business models work, how they interact, um, and hoping, and, and thanks a bit to uh, Martin and his panel this um, afternoon that the economics, uh, the economists will continue looking very closely at the interaction of all the levels um, that uh, these companies have been integrating into their business models. Hmm. One observation I, I'd like to make perhaps, uh, you know, to trigger a bit of uh, controversy. Uh, is that, I mean, one, one thing that, I mean, two things strikes me if you look at the, the sort of politics of, of the DMA and, and what's going on in, in Brussels. I mean, the first one is that uh, I've never seen such a degree of consensus on, on a piece of legislation. And, and for example, if you think about telecoms and electricity, you had really big fights uh, between the commission and the member states. Uh, I still remember the position of the French government when it came to uh, reforms in the electricity sector, they were not very happy about it. And same for other member states, in parliament, you had very big debates. In this case, I mean, of course, we, we have not seen the end of the legislative process, things may happen. But if you think about key member states like France, Germany, Netherlands, and some others, they're very aligned and they want the DMA and they want a strong DMA. And the more you talk to them, the more they want a strong DMA. And even if you, if you think about the parliament, we've seen all sorts of amendments, but nothing really going in a different direction. So it's a, it's a bit of a unique piece of legislation in particular, given its importance, when we think about the level of consensus you, you have about it. So that's my first point. But others may disagree, but at least that's my impression. The second point I, I want to say is that, in fact, you know, you can disagree with the approach of the DMA, but I don't see a lot of constructive criticism. Um, you know, it doesn't seem that anyone has come up with a real alternative. Um, if you look about the companies that are likely to be designated, I mean, they do various things. I mean, they will pay people to question the legal basis of, of the instrument, you know, to create some, I mean, say, well, you know, there's a risk that it might not go through. It could be struck down by the court of justice, or they will do bogus studies, you know, saying we create 3 million jobs that will go away if there's the DMA, or they do astroturfing, basically, you know, funding some, you know, association with 50,000, uh, you know, SMEs. But, you know, this is the usual lobbying stuff. There's nothing, you know, I haven't seen anyone coming with an alternative model um, that would be constructive in nature. Um, and that, that surprises me a little. Uh, you've got lots of smart people around and nobody seems to, you know, to, to come up with, with an alternative. So we, uh, Helena is asking a question in the chat. Uh, it's a good question. That maybe there's no disagreement on the DMA map by member states because there are no um, European or very few uh, European champions uh, that would be affected, which is a good question. Uh, Martin also has a, a direct a question on the direction of the DMA. So, but Martin, just be, before Martin, I just wanted to react to Damien. I, I'm not entirely sure. I think, you know, I think some people like the the UK style type of regulation. So, or, or would have proposed to to strengthen a market investigation tool, whereby uh, you know the the Commission, or, you know, or the regulatory body would have looked at a particular either a particular company or a particular market or type of service and really entered into more a more uh, cooperative collaborative exchanges with all stakeholders including you know the targeted companies uh, because that that would have created a unique opportunity i think to not fix rules you know in in, in, in into stone and 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 for the authority to gather a lot of information and data to run to do some analysis but anyway martin go ahead 
Yeah, I think my question is more at a high level. So not talking about the specific prohibitions. And of course, there have been alternatives posed. Uh, perhaps nobody is really unhappy about or doesn't say much about the DMA because it is so blurred as the overall goal. And uh, so everybody can read into it what he or she wants. Uh, I don't see that contestability and fairness necessarily go in the same direction. And I would like to see some guidance. Should we first try to get the contestability? Or, and if we don't manage, then we can perhaps try to go for some fairness. Or should we just kind of regulate, try to get fairness? And if that doesn't work, well, then we go for contestability. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure what is exactly the, the direction, um, the, the intent uh, in the DMA. And I also would then perhaps like to hear from the panel, uh, well, which direction should it go? And I think the, the, the German uh, Competition Act in a way is much clearer. It focuses much more on the contestability part in a way, is really keeping markets open or opening markets. Thank you, Martin. Can I say two, two things? First, on, on the consensus point, I, I agree with uh, what Damien said that, I mean, the, the same debate and the same consensus is starting to emerge in the US. So it's not because those are you and, and in China as well, in fact. So it's not that because there is a nationality. On the other hand, I think this other political dimension I was mentioning before, the fact that you know, there is a willingness from the state to take back control of the cyberspace more generally is also an enormous drive to do something. And I, and I think that is explaining why maybe some people don't care so much about the detail of the DMA, but they just want to take back control. Uh, and, and, and that sometimes worries me because they don't really look at the detail and the perverse effect that, that you were mentioning. And uh, to then come back to what Martin was saying, they don't have a very clear view of uh, the um, objective. I think those objectives are going in the right direction. They need to be clarified and, and it's possible. And um, But then the, the question that Martin was saying, if there is a tension, because okay, you can, you can see fairness in two ways. Fairness can be another version of contestability. Uh, that is a form of ex ante fairness. And I think some um, uh, are uh, pushing for that kind of interpretation, like for instance, uh, like uh, Schweitzer in, 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 in um, some of her paper. Um, others uh, like me, uh, I see more fairness as a kind of ex post fairness. And I think that's really, if you look at the definition in article 10, it's more an issue of, um, sharing uh, more equally the added value which is created by the market. But then indeed, if there is a conflict, it's not clear how it needs to be arbitrated. No, that is not new, you know. Again, if you go to, to, to the telecom uh, uh, regulation objectives, you have competition, you have innovation, you have um, interest of the user, and they are not always coincide either. And so the, the, it's up to the uh, regulators then to, to arbitrate um, that kind of conflict. Mm. It seems to me that the focus of, of object on objectives is a bit of an academic sport in a way. You know, I mean, I, I was not, I was not, you know, privy to the discussions that that took place, you know, in in, in the commission. Uh, but I, I, what I can tell you is that the commission spoke with a lot of companies that wanted something to be done about their problems with, with the platforms. They took that on board. They also looked at, you know, the competition cases and looked at the problem and some possible remedies. But I don't think that the, the, the focus was very much on objectives. I, I think they may have even, you know, reversed engineered the objective once they had a, a clear view about what they wanted to do. Uh, and you know, I mean, if you talk to governments and, and policymakers, uh, like I do regularly, I mean, the focus is never on objectives. Um, I, I see the problem of objectives much more present in academic discussions, because of course, academics want to make sense of the rules uh, and want to find some sort of organizational pattern. But I think the sausage is made in a much dirtier way uh, than, than, you know, one would think. That is, that is a worrying thought that, that, <laughs> that the lawmakers and, and regulators don't really try to think about the objective of what they are planning to do. That, that's a bit scary. I, I, I may be wrong. I think, I think that's I the role wrong. of the academics to make sense of all of that. 
<laughs> and I think it's possible. <laughs> it's really possible. That's our role, I mean, to do that. Maybe just to add that as a competition regulator, um, I think um, we are um, I, having goals, clear goals, is very helpful as a regulator. Good. Like Martin said, I mean, you have to take priority decisions, for example, yeah, and even be it 60 or 600 people working on this at European level, they will still have to take priority decisions. And it's very helpful to have goals <laughs> in order to take priority decisions. Otherwise, okay, I mean, this is, um, of course, something that regulating uh, the, the regulators for telecoms, etc., know very well that um, other people then take priority decisions. This, this is what has been happening, of course, also in regulation. And I mean, um, it's um, interesting to see that the European Court of Justice has just decided that the German regulator in energy issues doesn't seem to be independent enough. But the less goals you have in your in your in your legislation, the more, of course, there is scope for for I don't know kind of intervention from from other parts of the government body. And just one remark: I mean, I agree with um, what has been said that um, the um, the idea that there needs to be something done about the big tech companies is obviously worldwide and does not um, stop um, or, or um, is also being discussed in those countries where these companies have their seats. But I do also think that if um, we would have clear European companies that have a role of one of these uh, that we are talking about, then the debate on the details might have been a bit more detailed <laughs> because uh, there would have been more lobbying, of course, uh, within Europe, uh, more effective with regard to um, the role or the position of member states in, in the debate, also the European Parliament, most probably. Thank you. So there, there is, I, I think we need to stop. We, we have come, we have even run uh, past the, the end time of, um, of this conference. There's one, uh, a few um, last um, messages in the chat box. I wanted to thank you, uh, Silke, Alexandre, and Damien, very much for participating, and, and Martin for you know, and with us, Compass Lexicon organizing this event. I hope uh, everybody um, learned something from it and enjoyed it. Martin, maybe you want to have the last word. Martin? Yeah. Well, uh, if, if you want, <laughs> what, if you force me to do it, okay. Oh, no, but, I'm not forcing you and, to And that we also thank you, Valerie, for, for uh, chairing the second panel and uh, to the awesome. speakers on this panel of providing us, uh, leaving us outside this very narrow economist view and providing us the yeah. broader picture. Thanks a lot. Well, yeah, thank you. And it was, uh, I think it, it means that the well, I think it shows the utility, the, 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 the utility of having academics, you know, um, discussing very specific issues and on the other side, enforcers and practitioners, because of course it has to meet somewhere. It has to, you know, our, our work and yours uh, have to be, you know, consistent and, and working in hand. So it's very interesting to have those, um, those, those form of conferences where we mix the two. And uh, this is not the end of it. I think we'll, there will be uh, <laughs> many more opportunities to discuss, especially once we start, uh, once this DMA comes into force and we need to implement it. That will be, that will be fun. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure you know, having this discussion. And um, I wish you a very good evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.